Welcome to the Deeper Dive Podcast, brought to you by the OC Church of Christ. Let's dive deep into God's Word, learning new insight and taking a fresh look at the verses that impact our daily lives. We will continue with our study of the Minor Prophets by studying out the book of Micah. Here is John Oakes. All right, let's talk about Micah. Uh, uh, Micah is a perfect book to follow up Amos because really uh, Micah is the Amos of the southern kingdom is what it really comes down to. So um, uh, Micah prophesied both to Israel and to Judea or to Judah, but he prophesied primarily to Judah. So when we're classifying him, we'll list him with Isaiah. Micah and Isaiah have a very similar time frame they're, they're prophesying. Uh, their, their message is quite different, although they have some overlap. Uh, as we'll see, there's, uh, there's actually one little section in the beginning of Micah 4, which is, seems to be almost an exact repeat. Who's repeating who, we don't know, uh, from Isaiah chapter 2. So, Micah, uh, which means, who is like Jehovah? A good question is, do, do the names of the prophets, does that have significance about the prophecy that they gave us? You know, my answer is, I don't know, because almost everybody back then had a name that had some religious significance to it, all right? Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, Micah is from Moresheth Gath. All right, so here's a map, kind of give you the idea. Uh, it was about uh, 20 miles southwest of Jerusalem. And it would be in the sort of the foothills, if you will, uh, leading up to the mountains where Jerusalem were. It was a, a small town, a farming area. Uh, whether or not Micah was actually a farmer, we don't really know. Uh, I've heard it proposed that he was a lawyer. Uh, we don't really know. Uh, some of the uh, imagery he uses is court room imagery, uh, but clearly he came from an area where um, farming was pretty much the only thing that was being done around there. So he's, he, he's prophesying from Judah to Judah, whereas Hosea is prophesying uh, from Judah to Israel. I assume that Ho, uh, uh, Amos actually went up to Israel, but he was a Judahite as was Micah. Micah comes from the countryside And that seems to be pretty relevant to the thoughts that he has, to the issues he raises. He and Isaiah parallel ministries, but quite different family background, life background, as I'll mention. So Micah is is preaching from the countryside and he sets himself against the, uh, the, the wealthy, the arrogant and the aristocracy of the people of Jerusalem and also Samaria. Um, He's mentioned in in Jeremiah 26, 18. Let's go there quickly, Jeremiah 26, 18. You have to understand, this is 100 years later. So are they going to be remembering you? Brian Kelly, are they going to be remembering you 100 years from now? Are they going to be still mentioning you? All right. I'm, I'm sure they will. I, you just happen to be on the screen. It's the only reason I use you as an example, Brian. But 100 years later, uh, Jeremiah 26, verse 18. And if they would say this about me 100 years after I died, I would say that's pretty encouraging. All right. Uh, 26, 18. Oh, do I have the wrong passage? Ah, oh, rats. Oh, Yes, here it is. Uh, Micah of Moresheth, that's Moresheth Gath, prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah. He told all the people of Judah, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Zion will be plowed like a field. Jerusalem will become a heap of ruins. That's uh, Micah 1.6. The temple uh, the temple hill, a mound overgrown with thickets. And so, um, you know, uh, he had um, an outsized influence even a hundred years later. Uh, and he was known for speaking the truth to power. And if there's anybody in the Old Testament who spoke truth to power, it was certainly Jeremiah. So I think Jeremiah is 
kind of thinking back to Micah. Now, Micah was doing the kinds of things I'm trying to do right here. Uh, a quote that I saw uh, from one of the uh, books I read is he had Hosea's loving heart and Amos's heart for justice. And he's some I've heard him called the Amos of the Southern Kingdom. So like I said, it's so appropriate that we cover Micah immediately after Amos. That was an accident of our uh, of our class, but it's a good accident. He's a younger contemporary of Isaiah, but he was not a courtier. Uh, Isaiah was in Jerusalem. He had relationships with the royal family. Isaiah was a priest. I don't believe Micah was. And so Micah is addressing issues related to things that people in the country would care about. And he's particularly critical of sort of the, the, the people in the inner circles of power. So uh, Isaiah addresses sort of big national issues related to, to the nation of, of, of Judah and all the nations around. Micah is a little bit more uh, dealing with issues related to personal worship and social morality. There, like I said, there is some parallel. Oops, I forgot to forward my screen here. There is some parallel uh, between Isaiah and Micah. And as we're reading Micah 4, 1 through 3, you're going to think, I read that somewhere before, and uh, it's very, very similar. It's not identical, but it's very similar to Isaiah 2, 2 through 4. Let's go up to the, the mountain of the Lord. All nations will stream to it. Very famous kingdom prophecy. Micah has significant amount of kingdom prophecy. Uh, uh, Micah 1, 5, to give you a feeling for uh, his attitude towards city people. Micah chapter 1, verse 5. He said, all this is because of Jacob's transgression, because the sins of, of the people of Israel. And what is Jacob's transgression? Is it not Samaria? And what is Judah's high place? Is it not Jerusalem? So basically, Jacob, that, that, that's Ephraim, the northern kingdom. So the sin of the northern kingdom is Samaria, its capital. And the sin of the southern kingdom of Judah, it is Jerusalem. So this is the country guy. And uh, again, Greg said, you know, you want to, you know, you don't want to necessarily go with any one party. Uh, I don't know what the equivalent would be today. The, the, I guess maybe uh, the, the countryside folks, you, you kind of get the feeling who they're even with politically. All right. So a, a, a theme of Micah. A theme of Micah. Those who live luxurious lives and seek to placate God through offering money are vampires in the sight of God. They're sucking the life out of the poor. To give a, a feeling for the time frame for Micah, uh, Micah 1.1, 1, 1, the word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth during the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And these are kings of Judah. All right. Um, so this is, there, there would be some overlap, say, with Hosea or Amos. This is 8th century, late 8th century. So, uh, for example, uh, Jotham ruled from 742 to 735, uh, Ahaz from 735 to 715, and Hezekiah from 715 to 687. Uh, this is the period when uh, Samaria was completely destroyed. In fact, in uh, Micah 1, there's a prophecy that Samaria will be completely destroyed. And that prophecy was fulfilled during Micah's um, career as a prophet. Uh, I'm sure he wasn't gloating over that, unlike Edom. Remember, yesterday was gloating over the destruction of Jerusalem. All right, uh, so... Um, so some of his prophesying happened while Samaria was still in place. And then he continued to prophesy after Samaria had been destroyed. So his career would be roughly 740 to 710 BC. So he, he, um, starting uh, Isaiah's, uh, Isaiah had a very long career from all the way near 750 BC, all the way down to the very early 7th century BC. Uh, the, the whole thing with Hezekiah and all that, that's 701 B.C. So Isaiah, 
a little bit before Micah, continued a little bit after Micah, but their careers overlap and they're both in the southern kingdom. All right. So Micah has scathing attacks against those who use their wealth and power to placate God and to abuse the poor. Micah 3.8 gives you a feeling for Micah's character. Micah doesn't talk about himself much, of course, but in one place he actually does. Micah 3 verse 8. He says, but as for me, as for me, I am filled with power, with the spirit of the Lord, with justice and with might to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. So you get a sense, this guy, you don't mess, you don't mess with this guy. And, and wouldn't that be great if, if we could say, you know, to the church that we're leading, I am filled with power, with the spirit of the Lord and with justice and might. Now, you probably wouldn't actually say that. Sounds a little bit prideful, but to declare to Jacob his transgression. So we have to remember that one of the things we're called to do is to declare transgression and sin. I believe in this generation, in churches in general, but even in our church, I, I, I believe we don't preach righteousness. I don't think we preach holiness enough. I don't think we mention judgment as often as we should. Um, you know, the tendency is every generation tends to stress one of God's qualities out of balance of his other qualities. If we go back to, say, uh, Calvin or Zwingli, they stressed God's sovereignty. And they, they, God has a number of qualities, his holiness, his love, his justice, his omniscience, his omnipotence. And the tendency is to get out of balance. And so if you overstress something, say, like his sovereignty, then you get sort of a hyper-Calvinistic predestination. God does everything and we have no free will. So which of God's qualities tend to be out of balance in the way they're stressed in preaching? I believe across the Christian world today in most areas, but also in our church, I think it's God's love, not God's mercy. I don't think God's mercy is overstressed, but I think we don't talk enough, honestly, about judgment, about coming judgment. It's not a fun topic. You know, I, I did a, a, a sermon series out of Ezekiel uh, last year. And, uh, you know, when you're doing Ezekiel, you could either preach 20% of Ezekiel or you could talk about sin <laughs> and you can talk about the need for repentance. You know what I'm saying? And it's uncomfortable, but I'm telling you, if you're going to have the voice of the prophet, you will be calling out sin specifically. And you're not going to just call it out. You're going to tell people that if you're not going to repent, you're going to go to hell. All right? How much do you talk about hell in your preaching? Now, I, I don't, I, we're not going to go to Jonathan Edwards, you know, hellfire and brimstone preaching. That's all we do. We're not going to try to emotionally shock people into repenting and that kind of stuff, although maybe just a little bit of that might occasionally be called for. So, themes in Micah. Social, I'm saying social injustice <laughs> rather than social justice, social injustice. But of course, we all know the most famous passage in Micah, Micah 6, 8, is talking about justice. And not necessarily, like Greg said, it's not just social justice. There's other kinds of justice. All right. Um, against the powerful of the land. So against the abuses of those who have power. And I, 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 I preached a series from James pretty recently. I taught a series from James. And, and James points out, you guys are giving the seat of honor to the rich people. But that's kind of dumb because the rich people, they're the ones who are abusing you. And so who is in a place of power? Who has power and control in our country? Well, <laughs> white men to some extent, you know what I'm saying? And so uh, we need to um, be careful that we don't bow down to those who are in positions of authority and power. 
All right. Uh, hope for restoration. There's a lot of hope. Uh, a higher proportion, I think, <laughs> of Micah uh, providing uh, hope for the future. Every single book of the Bible, virtually without exception, talks about salvation and hope and the restoration of a remnant. But there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that in Micah. Uh, a, a, a pretty even balance, I think, uh, between uh, doom and judgment and repentance and also hope for restoration. So there's a whole three-chapter section on that with, uh, with more even later. All right. So that's kind of some of the themes of Micah. Got to have an outline, right? Uh, so here we go. Chapter one through three, judgment for the sin of Judah and for the sin of Samaria, by the way, but primarily for the sins of Judah. All right. And then chapter four and five, hope for a remnant. And then chapter six through seven, God's justice and his mercy. Here, essentially, God is defending himself against the charges of those who who have a problem with the way God has been acting. All right, great. Now let's get the, into the actual text. Micah 1, it feels like a courtroom scene. And that's why some people have, have, have said that, that you know maybe Micah is a lawyer. I don't know if I buy that. Honestly, I'm not sure how many lawyers they had in Marisheth Gath, but it's possible. All right, so this is, chapter one is a scathing indictment of Judah and Samaria. Now, chapter one is primarily Samaria, whereas chapter two and three, it seems we're leaving Samaria behind. Uh, One of the confusing things is sometimes Israel in the minor prophets means the northern kingdom. Sometimes Israel means both. And sometimes Israel means the southern kingdom. So when you're reading, uh, it can be confusing. So you have to let the context speak for itself. I have that or pull out a commentary and they might help you with that. All right, verse three. Look, the Lord is coming from his dwelling place. He comes down and he treads on the heights of the earth. The mountains melt beneath him and the valleys split apart like wax before the fire, like water rushing down a slope. We have a theophany here. God is coming to earth. Now, there's two words. They've always confused me. By the way, don't use the word theophany in a sermon. You could if you want, but if you do, you better better define it, all right? But there's two words that for years and years, they, they confuse me. One is the word theophany. The other word is the word theodicy. And I'm telling you, it was. And I'm I'm not a dumb guy, but it was many many years before I figured out the difference between those two words. Okay, the, theophany is essentially the day of the Lord when God comes. The greatest. What is the greatest theophany in history? Uh, how about John chapter one? Right, the Word of God became flesh. So theophany is God coming in some way. Theodicy, that's a, that's a theological term. When we're talking about theodicy, that's basically defending the character and sovereignty of God and explaining how God's love, his mercy, his justice, and his holiness all work together to get a consistent picture of who God is. So theophany is kind of like a God coming. Theodicy, that's a, um, that's a theological term. Uh, Greg, do you agree, correct, add to that? Uh, or did I get it right? Simply put, the Odyssey is the justice of God, yep. you know, and the Alchemy is, is is God's ultimate presence in in in, in the world. God coming, yeah, the Lord. Right. So Job would be a, a book about theodicy, not about theophany. Got it? Good. All right. Uh, chapter uh, one, verse six. Uh, well, ch- verse five. It's, this is because of Jacob's transgression, and Jacob is a, a, a stand-in for the idea of the northern kingdom. All right, generally, not always, but generally. Um, and like I said, what is Jacob's transgression? It's Samaria, Judah's it's high places, Jerusalem. Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap of rubble, a place 
for planting vineyards. I will pour her stones into the valley and lay bare her foundations. This happened 722 B.C. So we can assume uh, that Micah is, it's parts of Micah were obviously written before 722 B.C. So bottom line is, chapter 1, he's not very specific about the sins. He's going to be much more specific about the sins in chapter 2 and 3. Basically, Micah chapter 1, just sin. <laughs> There's just a lot of sin going on here. And therefore, the day of the Lord is coming, a day of judgment specifically on Samaria. So what does Micah do? He says, ha, 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 all right, it's so great. Yeah, those, those rivals, the, the Israel, they're going to get wiped out. No, not exactly. Verse 8. Because of this, I will weep and wail. You know, when we see God judging other people, let's not get fired up about that. When God's judgment comes, even on our enemies, even on people we don't love or even like. By the way, uh, we, we're doing a, a calendar for the month in, in Bakersfield. So every day you're doing something. And one day it was pray for somebody you don't like. So I call, I call a, few, a few people on the phone and said, I'm, I'm praying for you today. All right. But we, knew, we do need to pray for those we don't like, right? And we need to love our enemies. Amen? Because I will weep and wail, I will go about barefoot and naked. I will howl like a jackal. You know, in, in our culture, when you're mourning, you're really, really quiet. You go into one of these viewings. Shh. But for Israel, they would wail and you know, throw dust in there. They were very, very dramatic. He says, for serious plague is incurable. And worse than that, it has spread to Judah. And although Micah is concerned about the northern kingdom, honestly, he's more concerned about the southern kingdom. It's okay to be more concerned about the people you're responsible for than those other people. That's okay. And the, one of the worst possible things he can say about the sin of Samaria is that it, it infected the southern kingdom. And then I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go into detail on verse 10 uh, through the early part of chapter 2, but what he does is it's very poetic and it's a bunch of puns. And like I said, puns just don't work super great. All right, uh, so uh, verse 10 through 16 is a bunch of Hebrew puns. Got it? And he's using cities and towns in the southern kingdom in Judah to explain what's going on. All right. So uh, he says, tell it not in Gath. Well, the word Gath means tell. So tell it not in tell. All right. Got it. And here we go. Here's one of my books. I'm using 12 minor prophets. So he says, uh, harness your horses Oh, Lakish. Well, Lakish means horses. So it would be like, harness your horses, horse town. And then he talks about Akzib. And he says, Israel's kings are ever balked. And so they're being balked in the city of Balk. Like, you know, balking as in, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I'm not going to go into all those puns. I'll just say there's a whole bunch of puns, which would be kind of fun and funny. But I'm going to skip to chapter 2. Got it? We're in Micah 2. So in Micah 2, he's shifting focus away from Samaria. He's focusing on Judah. In fact, it's possible that Micah 2 and 3 were written after the destruction of Samaria. We don't know that for sure. Uh, there's some evidence that it's certain, almost certainly some of Micah was after the fall of Samaria simply because in chapter 1, verse 1, he says, during the reign of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah didn't even come to the throne till 315. Got it? Okay, great. Chapter 2, uh, verse 2. I think verse 2 probably gets at the specific kinds of sin that Micah is looking at probably perhaps better than any other verse. So let's read it carefully. They covet their they covet fields and seize them and houses and take them. They defraud people of their homes. They rob them of their inheritance. 
Therefore, the Lord says, I am planning disaster against this people from which you cannot save yourselves. Ouch. You will no longer walk proudly, for it will be a time of calamity. So we see pride here. Coveting fields. <clears throat> now, if you look at the uh, Mosaic Covenant, uh, the Mosaic Covenant was very careful to protect the land of poor people. And essentially, it was illegal to buy people out and seize their territory. And if you did, in the year of Jubilee, it would be returned to those people. Now, you can assume by this time, in both the northern and the southern kingdom, that policy was not being put into effect. So basically, what they would do is they would steal people's inheritance. As you know, farming goes up and down, right? Farming goes up and down. So these rich people, they would loan money to the poor landowners during times of famine or 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 or, play, or whatever, and then uh, when the when they weren't able to pay it back, they would seize their land and build ever bigger, ever bigger estates. And so what happened is the landowners became serfs, and um, God hated this kind of activity. So the, so the powerful were getting ever greater land holdings. And this violated the Mosaic Covenant. But these people, they didn't care. All right, so you basically had the, the 1% that had 90% of the wealth and the 99% that had all the rest. A kind of a familiar situation, which is um, escalating. All right, and so we may, we may not be taking a political side on this issue, but as disciples, we don't like the idea that the rich are constantly getting richer at the expense of the poor. That is something we don't agree with, we don't support, and we don't like. All right, and so verse 3, they're walking proudly. God is defending justice for the poor. God always defends justice for the poor, for the outcast. And that sort of thing. And these people, they're walking around proudly. And the, the, see, the Jews under uh, kind of had this idea that if you're wealthy, it's because God is blessing you. You're in his good graces. Even in John 9, you can see them thinking that. But it's not true. So, um, so how do these rich people, who are essentially getting richer and richer and richer, uh, piling up wealth, uh, but... Uh, earning disgrace in God's kingdom, all right? Um, what do they do when Micah comes along and he declares to them that's not right? Well, here's what happens. Verse 6, they say, do not prophesy, their prophets said. That, by the way, there were prophets who were in the court. And, and this is interesting because Isaiah was a prophet serving in the court in Jerusalem. Is um, Micah somehow even criticizing even Isaiah? I don't think so. But uh, Micah from the countryside is looking at these prophets who are in the court of the king and thinking, these guys are just yes people. They're, 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 they're not going to challenge. They're not going to challenge those who are in authority or in power. So, so uh, the, the prophets that are you know buddies with the king and either Samaria or or in Judah, they're saying, stop prophesying. Don't prophesy about these things. Don't preach about justice. Don't, stop talking about pride. Stop talking about sin. You descendants of Jacob, should it be said, does the Lord become impatient? Does he do such things? Do not my words do good to the ones whose ways are upright? And so uh, basically Micah says, you ain't shutting me up. And we have a lot of false prophets today. I'm telling you, a lot of false prophets. I remember I was in uh, Nigeria in Port Harcourt a few years ago. And, I, you know, I was just talking about holiness and righteousness and all that kind of stuff and calling out, you know, wealth and all that. And a, a, a preacher from a local church came up and he said, thank you so much. Everybody here preaches the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel rules almost the entire continent of Africa. You think, well, I thought they weren't—they didn't have any rich people there. 
Well, you know, uh, uh, poverty is not a cure for materialism. I'll tell you that right now. But many people who occupy pulpits in America today, they preach prosperity. And they preach what I would call easy believism, you know? Just pray Jesus into your heart, you're good to go. You know, come to church occasionally. Uh, if you're more committed to that's great, but you know, we're all we're all good, I'm good to go. I'm good, you're good, I'm okay, you're okay. But the majority of their congregants are going to hell. I'm not gonna specify which ones, it's not my place to judge, but woe to those who are at ease in Zion to the complacent in Samaria, right? To the foremost men of the, of the supposedly noblest nation. In verse 6, he says, he says, disgrace. They say disgrace will not overtake us. But we need to be willing to preach against materialism. Okay? Being wealthy is not a sin, but being wealthy is... Uh, a challenging, tempting situation. All right, uh, verse 11. Again, he's speaking against these false preachers. He says, if a liar and deceiver comes and says, I'll prophesy for you plenty of wine and beer, that would be just the prophet for these people. Ouch, ouch. Uh, you know, uh, it reminds me of... of uh, is it? Yeah. Second Timothy four, you know, what their itching ears want to hear. I don't know if they're going for if they're Budweiser people or they're, um, 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 you know, whatever. Um, interesting. From chapter one through chapter three, it's all uh, sin, 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 repent. Justice is coming. The day of the Lord is coming. And there's this interesting interlude. Chapter two, verse 12 and 13. In fact, uh, one or two commentaries said that that was not even in the original. By the way, be careful when you read these commentaries. They're helpful, they're useful, they're important, but be careful. For example, this one commentary said that um, Micah chapter 4 and 5 were written after the exile. Why? Because it prophesies things that happened after the exile. You know, I believe Micah wrote all of Micah. <laughs> you, you can't make money from saying, uh, writing a PhD saying, the person who says on the title wrote it is the one who wrote it. You know what I'm saying? And so we've got to be careful of the presuppositions. By the way, you know, I threw this thing away. That was probably a little disrespectful. I actually use this. There's some useful stuff in here. Uh, you know, I'm not against using it, but you got to understand, folks, some of these people don't even believe the Bible's inspired by God. So don't forget that, all right? And that's a bunch of garbage that this was written after the prophecy was fulfilled. I mean, the the bottom line is, like it says in Deuteronomy, if the thing they predict doesn't happen, then, you know, get rid of them. And one of the things that, that Micah prophesied is the destruction of Samaria, all right, and one of the things Ezekiel prophesied is the destruction of Jerusalem. So these guys were making, but they weren't primarily predicting the future, but they did predict the future in the near term and in the distant term. And this idea that these commentators can come in and say, oh, that was written later, that's a bunch of garbage. That is, that, that you can tell it makes me angry. I, I get angry about that. But verse 12 and 13 No, this was not written later after God gathered a remnant. Come on, give me a break. But verse 12 and 13, I will surely gather all of you, Jacob. I will surely bring together the remnant of Israel. I'll bring them together like sheep in a pen, like a flock in its pasture. The place will throng with people. The one who breaks open the way will go up before them. They will break through the gate and go out. It's like if they're, they're going to kind of like rip the doors of your church building open and come pouring in. I, I love the, the equivalent of that in, um, in, I think it's Zechariah, where they say, you know, 10 people will say to a Jew, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord. And so God will restore it. This idea of a remnant, this is one of the, uh, one of the uh, principal themes or ideas throughout the prophets, the idea that God is calling out a remnant. I love how Ezekiel, 
You know, he says a third to the whirlwind and a third to the sword and a third to the fire. But then he takes some of those hairs and he puts them into his garment. And that's the remnant that God will save. God is always saving a remnant. And I just pray that we, we bring as many people into that remnant as we can. I, I love in verse 32, it says, they're going to break open a way. I've been to Odessa. And it's amazing what God did in Russia in 1990 and 1991. It's incredible. It was a, 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 a time when God, it was a kairos, a time when God's spirit broke out in a special way. And God will do things like this again. When it's going to come, we don't know. That's why we need to be aware of God working in the world. We need to be like Micah who looks at this devastating situation, he says, but there's going to become a time when God will call a remnant. This is a kingdom prophecy. But we've got lots more kingdom prophecy in Micah, so I'm going to move on to chapter 3. All right. Uh, verse 1. Listen, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers, rulers of Israel, should you not embrace justice? You know, people who don't notice the idea of justice in the Old Testament aren't paying attention. People that saying all we have to do is share our faith and go out and convert people and not care about uh, justice issues, even for people that maybe we never even would convert. Just creating justice in this world. Why? Because that's what God does. We're trying to create a vision of the kingdom here on earth. He says, you should have known better, you leaders. You should have embraced justice. Instead, you're protecting the rich. You're protecting your buddies. You're having these little meetings and you're arranging the political situation so that the poor will be cut out and won't have a chance. God doesn't like that. In fact, he gets pretty upset about that kind of stuff. Look at verse 2. It says, you hate good and love evil. You tear the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones. You eat my people's flesh, strip off their skin, and you break their bones in pieces. This is not literally true. This is hyperbole. But God wants us to take the idea of justice seriously. Don't give favoritism in your church to the people who give more money. Now, if there's people that are giving money, amen for that. You know what I'm saying? But we need to take care of the poor and the needy, always. We, we, you know, we can never get away from that. It look, I mean, it's incredible. You who tear the skin and strip it from the flesh. That's how he's describing the, the, how the wealthy are abusing and taking the land and taking away opportunity and hope from the poor. That's how he describes it. Pretty intense, wouldn't you say? Uh, verse 5. Uh, this is what the Lord says. The prophets, they, they don't mind. The preachers, yeah, wealth, sure. You know, nice facilities and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Sure, sure, sure. As for the prophets who lead my people astray, they proclaim peace. I'm okay, you're okay, pray Jesus into your heart, you know, just uh, nice, you know, be a nice person, be a good person. Have you ever been to a funeral where they said, well, this person probably going to hell, you know, it didn't happen a whole lot. I, I had to preach a, a sermon for, a, for a, a young lady that I was, I'm convinced almost certainly is going to be in hell. And so am I going to get up there and say, yeah, I'm so glad we're going to see that we're going to be with her. She's in heaven just waiting for us. She was a druggie, you know, um, that's that's a tough situation. That's a really tough situation. But, you know, like Jeremiah said, they say peace, peace when there is no peace. And a prophet does not declare peace when there is no peace. Wait a minute. I thought Jesus offers peace that passes understanding. Absolutely. Peace that passes understanding for those who are in a world that does not have that peace that they have. That's one of the blessings of being in the kingdom. All right. Um, I already mentioned uh, verse 8, uh, verse 9, chapter 3, verse 9. Hear this, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of Israel, who despise justice and distort all that is right. They would... They would not agree with this charge. We don't despise justice. We love those people. 
but by your actions, you're saying something different. All right. Verse 12. This is this is one of those memory verses. This is the summary of the first three chapters. Here it is. This is an intense verse. Chapter 3, verse 12. Therefore, because of you, you leaders of Israel, who are more concerned with lining your pocket and having beer and going on nice vacations than taking care of the needs of the poor, Zion will be plowed like a field. Jerusalem will become a heap of rubble, a temple hill, a mound overgrown with thickets. 586 B.C. That's exactly what happened. All right? But guess what? We're going to have some hope. (laughs) All right. Some comfort. Some future glory. Amen for that? Amen for that. But, all right? Now, I believe there's a word that's missing that it was in the original text of the Hebrew, but it got lost. After chapter 3, verse 12, after the word thickets, there should be the word but. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But we're, we're turning to hope. In the last days, and what, what are the last days? Hebrews chapter 1, in these last days. So this is a kingdom prophecy that has been fulfilled in our days. Correct? And, and in the kingdom study, by the way, uh, for those of you who have been around for a while, I created a new version of the kingdom study that's, that doesn't have those mistakes. <laughs> so send me an email, I'll send it to you. Uh, but uh, Isaiah 2, that was part of our kingdom study. And I, I don't know about you, I love doing that kingdom study. I cringed a little bit, but I love doing it. And so this is Micah's version of the thing that was in the kingdom study. In the last days of the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as highest of all the mountains. He's talking about the kingdom of God. He's talking about the church to the extent that the church is an outpouring or a picture of the kingdom of God. The mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and people will stream to it. Amen. Many nations will come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, which is a religious way of saying Jerusalem. How do we know? The word of the Lord from Jerusalem. That's exactly what happened. Acts chapter 2, Pentecost. Is that what this prophecy is about? It's certainly something it's about. Is that all it's about? I don't know. Certainly something it's about. He will judge between many peoples. He will settle disputes for the strong Nations far and wide, they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Everyone who sits down under their vine and under their own fig tree and no one will make them afraid for the Lord Almighty has spoken. All the nations may walk in the name of their gods, but we will walk in the name of the Lord. Amen. That's a, that's such an encouraging passage. It's a it's a kingdom prophecy, and it talks about many nations. And uh, you know, our the, there's a reason why we're called the ICOC because there's a lot of nations that God has used us to spread the gospel. And, and I'm thankful. I'm 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 actually kind of proud about that. I don't want to be too proud about it because we we know what happens when we get too proud. God already did that. We don't want to go there. Uh, it says, instruction will go out from Jerusalem. And I believe this is a prophecy about Pentecost. And they're not going to preach war anymore. We're, it's going to be a different kind of kingdom. It's not going to be a worldly kingdom. We're not going to have a king reigning on earth. We're not going to have a capital city. We're not going to have armies. We're going to be a peaceful kingdom. All right? And uh, black will be friend white. Palestinian will befriend Israeli. Russian will befriend Latvian. I can give you the backstory on that one. And yes, progressive will be bosom buddies with conservative. Absolutely. In the kingdom of God, that happens. Does that happen in the world? No. How many families have literally been ripped apart in the last four years because of the divisiveness that's gone on? 
But in the kingdom, we bring what is separated together. It is a beautiful thing. And I am so proud of our fellowship. Are we the only group of saved people? Absolutely not. But are we doing a pretty good job of bringing it together? Absolutely we are. Do we need to do a better job? Absolutely we need to. Do we need to keep having some of those talks we started having in the last few months? Absolutely. But I'm proud. So this is an apocalyptic eschatological view of the future. Oh, there are those big words. Eschatology is end times, right? And apocalyptic means in vivid, descriptive language. And he says here in verse 4, forever and ever. The kingdom will be forever and forever. On that day, verse 6 and 7. And that day, declares the Lord, I will gather the lame, I will assemble the exiles, and those I have brought to grief. Those who were scattered by the earlier judgment will be brought back. Is that about the restoration of Judah after, uh, you know, it was scattered by Babylon? Absolutely. Is that about God bringing the remnant into the church? Absolutely. Is that about God bringing us into heaven in the future kingdom? It's about all those things. Kingdom prophecies have this nature that they cover more than one thing in the same, in the same prophecy. All right. So the lame and, 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 and the, um, the, the, um, the alien will be come in, come into the kingdom and we'd be welcomed with open arms. But then he's got some bad news. Verse 10, writhe in agony, daughter of Zion, like a woman in labor, for now uh, you must leave the city. All right, great. So let's get to chapter 5. I wanna, I, I'm, I'm taking a little bit longer than I was planning, but we're almost done. We've got about another 10 minutes. Oh, my goodness. I've been going 50. I got too excited. I got too excited. But you know what, uh, Brian, you still have plenty of time. You're still good to go. So uh, there we go. Micah 5.2. I love Micah 5.2. All of us love Micah 5.2, don't we? But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, here he's going from a kingdom prophecy to a messianic prophecy. Uh, We're going to see in Zechariah, there's there's a zillion kingdom prophecies in Zechariah, and there's a zillion messianic prophecies in Zechariah. But here we're switching from kingdom prophecy, chapter 4, to messianic prophecy, chapter 5, more specific. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you're small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me, one will be ruler of Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Where was Jesus born? You know, there were two Bethlehems, right? Bethlehem, Ephrathah, that's the smaller of the two Bethlehems. And I don't know, I guess you could call it a coincidence, but it just so happens that's where Jesus was born, which is not a huge shock because... um, in uh, um, Second Samuel, God promised to David that you will never fail to have a king on my throne. So naturally, the Messiah would come from Bethlehem, the city of David. And verse 3 says, Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she was in labor bears a son. So God is saying that there's going to come a special time of God's deliverance uh, when a woman bears a son will be born in Bethlehem. That's pretty cool stuff. And then what, what's the Messiah going to do? Verse four, he will stand and shepherd his flock and just thank the Lord. Ezekiel 34, God will shepherd his people through the Messiah. In the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of his name, the majesty of the Lord, his God. All right, I'm going to skip forward uh, to chapter six. In verse five, five through six, he says he's going to rescue us from Assyria. So just, just a little note there, Hebrew, uh, Micah 5, 5 through 6, is about the fact that Assyria, after destroying the northern kingdom, Assyria is going to come and attack and nearly take all of Judah. But God will protect Judah in the time of Hezekiah. This is a prophecy that was fulfilled within a few years after Micah uh, finished his career, the year 701 B.C., the events that are recorded in Isaiah 36, in Isaiah 37, the destruction of 185,000 soldiers of Sennacherib, that is prophesied, that deliverance is prophesied in chapter 5, verse 5 through 6. Now let's get to chapter 6, 1 through 8. 
I think that's everybody's favorite passage in Micah. So let's read that. Stand up, plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear you mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? Have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and I redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you in Aaron and Miriam. My people, remember what Balak, him of Moab, plotted and what Balaam, son of Baor, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal. You got to be careful how you say that city, by the way. You got to be careful that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. What shall I come before with? What shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come for him with a burnt offering with calves a year old? Will he be pleased with a thousand rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? What's the answer to that rhetorical question? No, he will not. Shall I offer the firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Heaven forbid. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. This one preaches, folks. Might want to do your assignment out of Micah 6, 1 through 8. That'd be pretty good stuff. And, And God is calling as witness the very mountains and hills. The the earth, and and that happens in Romans 9. God calls the physical earth as a witness to what he has to say. Uh, I I wrote a a paper on this for a a class I took recently. I said, uh, what are moral, economic, and religious integrity? What do they mean to us as a community? They mean that we are to embody the qualities of God, which are justice and mercy. Every engagement we have with one another and with those in the world should be redemptive. Who am I quoting on that one, Greg? I'm quoting you. All right. We are to be the hands and the feet and the heart of God to our community. What God is calling us to do here is to be like him. Got it, folks? God is asking us to show, not just believe in, these qualities, to show what is good. God is calling on us to do what he does and to feel what he feels. He's calling us to do what he does and to feel what he feels, both. But the people say in verse one, oh, it's too hard. It's across the sea. How can we go and attain it? But God defends his character. He says, and and what does God require of you? To act justly, to love kindness. Verse 6 and 7. It's kind of a beautiful thing here. It's not kind of a beautiful thing. It's actually a really beautiful thing. So he says, "What, what does God want from us? Isn't that what everybody wants to know? Isn't that what everybody in our church want to know? I mean, bottom line, what does God want from us? Does he want us to bring burnt offerings? A burnt offering is something that even a poor person could have made, like a pigeon. A burnt offering, that's something a poor person could have made. Or how about a calf a year old? That's something a middle class person could have brought. A poor people can't sacrifice a calf a year old, but a middle class person could. How about a thousand rams? That's something only a really wealthy person could offer. Surely the stuff wealthy person offer, that would please God. And then he says, 10,000 rivers of oil, which is more than the wealthiest person ever born could ever offer. Even that would not do it. And if that's not enough, even the killing of, an, of a child, which, which is blasphemy in the sight of God. None of those. Oh, did my thing freeze? Yeah, apparently. I'm going like that. <laughs> is, it, is it frozen for you guys? The video? All right. I'm so close to that, I'm just not even going to bother to undo it. So you're going to look at me making a really weird face for the next couple of minutes, all right? 
because I'm going to just keep on going here. Now we're fixing it. What does God want? Burn offerings? Won't do it. Half a year old? Nope. Sharing your faith with 57 people? Uh, uh, reading the Bible from cover to cover? Uh, teaching false doctrine? No. Justice, kindness, and humility. That's what God wants from us. To act justly. Not, not just to believe in justice, but to act justly. Or even to create justice. This has to do with social obligation. It, it, it may or may not be social justice per se. Treating the people the way they ought to be treated. That's what it comes down to. Justice means treating people the way that God would want them to be treated. Essentially, the golden rule works pretty well here, right? To act justly is to take actions which create the world to be more right than it is right now. Can we fix all those problems? No, we cannot. For Micah, it's a world where the rich do not take advantage of the poor, where the non-Israelite is treated with dignity, where women are given respect equally with men. Next, to love kindness. There's that word hesed, to show covenant love, to show loyalty, kindness, faithfulness, mercy, Hesed is a big word. It comes out often in these different passages to show covenant love and kindness. To just be faithful. We'll talk about that in Malachi. Third, to walk humbly. Of course, if you walk humbly, you will act justly and you will show mercy. Do all this remembering your place with respect to God. Philippians 2. Consider others better than yourself, right? Having the mind of Christ, who I would say act justed, justly, loved, showed loving kindness and walked humbly, probably greater than any other human who ever lived. Not just a humble attitude, a humble walk. Remember earlier in chapter one, he talked about those who walked in pride. Those who walk in pride, Daniel, he is able to humble. A life that oozes humility. I like to think of Acts 20, where Paul said, I lived a life of complete humility. Imagine being so humble that you could say to people who knew you really well, I lived a humble life and get away with it. That's pretty amazing. So God envisions a society and a church where theology and ethics are the same, that what we teach and what we live agrees with one another. Hosea 12, 6 has almost the exact same list here. I don't have time to do Micah 6, 9 through 7, 20. Actually, Micah 6, 9 through 7, 20, it kind of repeats some of the earlier themes. Uh, it, 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 it preaches against ill-gotten gain, unfair EFA measures, unfair business practices, violence of rich people against the poor. But in, in chapter 7, he says, Judah will be vindicated. I'm going to... I'm going to Finish by reading verse 18 through 20. Who is a God like you, Jehovah, who pardons sin and forgives transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, praise the Lord, but you delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot. What a great picture. And you will hurl all of our iniquities into the depths of the sea. You will be faithful to Jacob. You will show love to Abraham as you pledged on oath to your ancestors in days long ago. God has always shown, has said, he's always had faithful love. Always. Jacob, I have loved. All right, so that's Micah. Uh, thoughts, questions, comments? Uh, thanks, John, for that. I love your, your passion. Um, what... One of my big takeaways uh, was just about, you talked about overstressing the, the qualities of God and, you know, like sometimes talking too much about God's love. Um, I definitely feel like for me, if, if, if I want to be a prophet, to, to talk about, just feel convicted of not talking about hell enough. Um, and yeah, just how do you
you go about maybe some things that you know you don't necessarily it's not your favorite thing to talk about or um, yeah how you, how you navigate that process oh uh, one thing is by preaching the word all right for example uh, it, it's tempting to preach Micah 6 1 through 8 you know and skip chapter 1 through 3 and so I, I remember uh, for our Bible talk uh, in, in San Diego, uh, we would we would just go through books. That's what we did for our Bible talk. So I remember we did Isaiah and we said, uh, we're not going to skip those chapters. Just, so you know, we're not going to skip those chapters. By the way, I don't I don't I, I wouldn't want to don't quote me as saying we, we talk about love too much. Uh, d- don't quote me. If I said that, that's not what I meant to say. OK, we just need a balanced theology. You can't love too much. It's impossible to love too much. But you can have unbalanced theology. So I would just say, you know, every once in a while, you need to have a sermon. And I'll, I'll let the church know. I said, by the way, just so, just so you know, today, the sermon's going to be kind of intense. You know, it, um, you know, you might go away uh, uh, feeling something. I remember when I taught Ezekiel in the Philippines, it was uh, like a 20-hour class or something like that. So the first eight hours was Ezekiel chapter one through Ezekiel chapter 23. At, at the end, it's like their hair was, you know, they're, <laughs> they're like that. But that's, that's what's there in the book. You know, we, we need to preach those things. I, I will tell you this. There's a pattern. Notice, what did Micah end with? Notice, what did Amos end with? So we need to end with hope. Always, always, always end with hope. Okay? Please, <laughs> do, do the people that you're uh, speaking to and preaching to, leave them with hope. Um, and I, I, I haven't done a careful study. There's probably a book somewhere. Remember Obadiah yesterday, it ended with hope. So when you do these sermons that you've never done for a long time, uh, please end with hope. I just happened to be in the Minor Prophets around December time. And I just noticed so much great mercy passages, like Micah uh, said when we just ended. Like, this is like amazing. Like, probably like top 10 best mercy passages in the Bible. And I feel like they're not as well known because we probably stay away from the Minor Prophets. And there's many reasons why. I think one of those reasons is because maybe the majority of the book or a good chunk of the book can be very intense and very. Uh, apocalyptic, apocalyptic language and be kind of maybe seem a little scary, but there's also so much greatness in it too. So I think I'm just looking forward to as a preacher to be able to uh, not just do the mercy memory verses like Micah six um, and Micah seven, but really taking uh, the congregation and our membership through that journey uh, because I think that allows these scriptures to even stand out even more because once you get this great scripture of mercy within this other book of judgments and day of the Lord, it's like, wow, this is, this is beautiful and it's really inspiring. So thanks, John. Yeah. Uh, A little comment on that. And I think it's revelation five where Jesus is described as a lion. And in the same chapter is described as a lamb. You know what I'm saying? And so, uh, I sometimes uh, ask people, so are, is this the lion right now or is this the lamb? You know, sometimes he comes as a lion. Sometimes he comes as a lamb. And I don't know about you, but uh, when I grew up, I was in a church that had strained, stained glass windows and it, there were only lambs. There, there weren't there weren't lions. They were only lambs. But Jesus is a lion. And he is a lamb. And, uh, and so... We need to let him be what he is. Great great point, Jacob. Appreciate that. Thank you, John Oaks. And thank you all for listening to Deeper Dive by the OC Church of Christ. If you want to get connected to us or want to donate to the program, go to our website, occhurchofchrist.com or through social media at the OC Church. Join us next time as we continue our deeper dive into the minor prophets. Oh,